quiet moments where it's just her. Speak peace to her heart and her mind. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank God for the blessing and the privilege of prayer. We know that we serve a God who specializes in answering our prayers. Even the prayers that we don't pray, God is working on that stuff as well. And the matters that we don't know to pray for, God is already tending to those. Thank God every, every week when I have the privilege to be in this sanctuary with you all, led in a period of prayer by Sister Shannon. I'm so blessed. Once again, she helps us by connecting the spiritual with the everyday life. Never would I have thought to put lace front, wig, weave, and all of that together, but the in-between times and the the stuck times. Brother, we can't relate to the lace front part, but we know about in-between. We have our own in between seasons as well. And so thank you, Shannon, for that. I find myself in my own season. On the 17th of July, my father suffered a stroke. And so I was away from you for some days. I had to be there with him and with my mother. And God is blessing. And every day there is a little bit of progress, a little bit of strength. Thank you all so much for the prayers and the phone calls. You have no idea how much that means to me. I was sharing with some individuals that for 14 years I have walked with so many of you all through these seasons of caring for your aging parents. And I've been at so many bedsides and in so many hospital rooms and so many places where there's been suffering and sickness. And I find myself in that same season. And, and all of what I've shared with you I just hear all of you sharing with me, and so thank you so much for that. Uh, just to, for those of you who are wondering and asking, even this morning you've been asking, how is my dad? My father has, is a true man's man, and so his greatest struggle at this point is the fact that he does not have his independence. He is still hospitalized. Uh, there is some, some damage. There is some, uh, there's no total paralysis. He has full function of his body. There are some, some speech things that we're working through, but God is able. God is able. Amen. 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 In April, my mother underwent a kidney transplant surgery, and now we are pleased to report that there is still no signs of rejection. She is now four months Four months into that, she now drives. She drives every day. She prepares her own meals. She cares for, she, she, her, her care and her health journey is all in her control. She meets with her transplant team uh, weekly. And so uh, she will be returning to, her, uh, to worship pretty soon. Um, as soon as she's capable, you know, with, with all this with my dad. And so uh, while there is uh, some sorrow because our family will never be the same, I still rejoice. I still rejoice because God is on his throne. Something happens when you call the name of Jesus. Something happens when you call on him. And I call that name, and I call it with a different type of zeal and vigor now, because I now have find myself in this new season, in this different space but nonetheless God is no less faithful now than he was in all the other seasons before amen amen amen, amen. if you have your Bibles turn with me to John's gospel in the sixth chapter I want to continue on with this series of messages conversations with Jesus conversations with Jesus in these passages, I'm just focusing on an exchange between Jesus and whomever. And this one, it happens to be with Jesus and his disciples. 
And there we will just look at some of the content of the conversation, the discussion, and see what principles can we draw from the exchange between Jesus and these individuals. Because these conversations are still conversations that we have today, conversations about religion and about relationships, about suffering. Today we'll talk about another matter that I believe is still so critical that we we struggle with it on a daily basis. It's a very, uh, very common and, and, and uh, very celebrated narrative for this is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. This is the only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. And so this is John's perspective on this miracle, chapter number 6, beginning with verse number 5. It reads this way, it says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. I want to use this narrative and talk this morning from the thought, a conversation about enough. A conversation about enough. You know, we were having a conversation with our kids a few days ago, and we were talking about uh, an event that before Cassandra and I were married, I had hosted a gathering at my apartment back in Houston, and, and you know, I, you know, your kids tend to think that you, you know, you didn't start living until they were born. Like there was, you had no other life before them. And, and sometimes it feels like, I don't even remember what life was like before I had children. But, but I remember on this day, it was, I believe it may have been Memorial Day weekend or something like that. But I had my apartment and I was going to host a few friends and we were going to have some hamburgers. I had a 10 by 10 flat skillet. I could cook four hamburger patties at a time. And I probably started with about six to eight people in my apartment. And as the day went on, people kept showing up. I had a 10 by 10 square skillet. And people kept showing up and I could only make four hamburger patties at a time. I had a 10 by 10 square skillet. People kept showing up you know and this was even before cell phones were real big but some kind of way people knew that something was going on at my apartment and they kept showing up the day grew late and some kind of way you know Jesus was in the midst because we kept having hamburger meat but eventually people showed up and there were no more burgers to be cooked we had run out of ground beef and And it was an awkward space to be in because I wanted to be a gracious host, but I had run out of food. I did not have enough 
to feed my guests. Have you been there before? That this, this message, this passage, this narrative and conversation is not just about the fact that when you run out of food to feed folk when they show up to your house, but it is about what we do in that space where we are lacking. And everybody knows what it feels like to lack, don't you? You all know what it feels like to be in space where you don't have enough of something. And there is nothing, it is frustrating to be in a season, in a space or place where you don't have enough. Everybody knows what it feels like not to have enough money, not to have enough time, not to have enough influence, not to have enough strength, not to have enough patience. These are all very real, real situations that we can find ourselves in. In our text, Jesus has started early on in his ministry, and he has now gotten into a boat and gone on to the other side of the lake there. The scriptures tell us that, that, he, that people started following him, his teaching. They were latching on to Jesus, and the disciples had not said anything. They were enjoying the company. They were appreciating having all of this press, having all of this attention, had all these people following them, following Jesus, and then it's got late in the day. Another gospel writer records that one of the disciples said, Jesus is getting late. There's a lot of folk out here. We better send them on home because they're going to get hungry. And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. In John's gospel, Jesus raises the question, how much money do you think it'd take to feed all these people? Philip spoke up very quickly. Philip said, we don't, not even half, it'd take more than half a year's wages to give everybody in this crowd just one bite of bread. They did not have enough. And Jesus proceeds, we know what he does, but he proceeds now to teach a lesson, not to the people eating, but more importantly, to teach a lesson to his disciples about how they need to understand life when they don't have enough. And I tell you that what Jesus taught his disciples, he's teaching us as well. Because all of us have gone through seasons and situations. Some of you may call it a season when you are lacking, when you are challenged, when you don't have enough. Or like Shannon said, when you're in a season of stuck. Where you can't move yourself forward, you can't move yourself backwards, you can't move yourself up, you cannot advance. You are just there because you lack whatever it takes to get you out of that place. Jesus will show us here how we can appreciate the seasons of lack where we can understand what it means to not have enough. Are you praying with me? In this exchange between Jesus and his disciples, we learn something about him as well as something about ourselves. And by the end of this narrative, I hope that we would all appreciate the fact that we will never be in a position or never be in a place where we do not have what we need provided that we are in the right place and in the right space. Amen. First thing is this, that you will never have enough within yourself. Let me just say that again, that you will never have enough within yourself. I'll say it this way, lack is fundamental to human experience. Maybe there's somebody here and you are down on yourself because you don't have enough money. Well, listen, it is a very uncomfortable position to be in. Nobody likes to be broke. And you're thinking now that if I just had X more dollars, I'd be all right. But you know what? You said that last year. And you got the same amount of X more last year. You thought you needed and you got it now. And here you are saying, if I had X more dollars, I'd be all right. And then when you get that, this time next year, you're going to say, if I had X more dollars, I'd be all right. The truth is that you'll never have enough because you all know that the more you get, the more stuff you buy, the more places you try to go, the more you have, the more you try to do. And so that's a whole different sermon right there because we need to talk about why you need to keep buying more and why you need to keep going more and why you need to have more. But nonetheless, you will never have enough within yourself. 
We all know what it feels like to lack, to not have enough money, to not have enough patience, to not have enough influence, to not have enough time, to not have enough resource. We all have been there, but guess what? It's in these spaces that God desires us to be sometimes because if you had everything you need, you would not need him. If you had everything you need, you wouldn't be sitting here right now. Don't get too holy on me, but I'm just telling the truth. If you had everything you needed, you'd be out on the lake, you'd be out at the beach, you'd be out on the shore, you'd be out on the water, you'd be out enjoying life, living your best life, all of that because you feel like I got everything that I need. But sometimes God will allow you to be without some stuff where all you can do is pray and fast and desire desire and hope and need God and look and wait for God because you can't do it by yourself. The crowd has placed Jesus and his disciples in a precarious predicament. They have followed Jesus out here and now they have become a burden to the disciples. I know it's a burden to the disciples because Jesus raised a question. How much money do you think it would cost to feed all of these people? And so it becomes their burden because the question that Jesus raises implies that it becomes their responsibility to feed them. Nobody had a problem when they were following them. Disciples didn't have no problem when they had an entourage. But now the entourage has become a problem. That's a word for us somewhere in there. That while people are giving us attention, we love them. But when they need something from us, we got a problem with them. You know, isn't that funny how sometimes we, we want everybody to come into the sanctuary and show up for church, but we get mad when folk ask for benevolence. We want everybody to be here to sing it on Sunday morning and to sing praises, but then when it comes time to feed them, we try to push, ration out how much we give them. Don't come back in the line anymore. Stop, keep, quit coming back up here. So why are you, how dare you try to take some food home? Don't you know some other folk got to eat we say all that kind of stuff but here Jesus tells his disciples now in essence he tells them you give them something to eat but Peter but Philip makes an observation Philip says it would take more than a half year's wages to give these people just a little bit of something to eat that he recognizes now we don't have enough to feed all of these people but I'm telling you it is a tactic of the enemy that the enemy will get you to think about your situation and think about your provision and you being the only person to provide for your needs. Philip had Jesus right there with him and it was the idea of Jesus to get them to feed these people and if Jesus has the idea, if Jesus tells them to feed them, certainly Jesus ought to know how it's going to get done. But because Jesus raised the question that he did, Philip assumed that he would have to do it in his own strength. And Philip knew right off the bat, there ain't no way in the world I'm going to feed all these people, Jesus. And that's how the enemy works. That he wants you to see your life looking solely through the lens of your own potential. Looking through the lens of your own resources. Looking through the lens of what you have currently in your... He wants you to see that all you got is all you have. He doesn't want you to look at God. He doesn't want you to look at the God who spoke to nothing and brought the world into existence. He doesn't want you to look at the God who died for you and saved you. He doesn't want you to look at the author and the finisher of your faith he does not want you to look at your bridge over troubled waters he doesn't want you to look at the one who makes a way out of no way the enemy only wants you to see yourself and when you see yourself you say I'm not enough I don't have enough don't have enough. don't know where it's coming from no way it can be done and so you will stay stuck if you keep looking at yourself that the enemy does not want you to see what you have in God he only wants want you to see what you have in yourself and so here Philip is saying we ain't got no business trying to feed these people and so they never were and guess what God never intended for you to be self-sufficient even though God created us in his likeness and image God knew you couldn't take care of yourself 
God knew that you didn't have everything you needed. God knows that your body needs rest, and when you sleep and you can't protect yourself, God knows that you cannot do everything that is necessary to keep yourself thriving in life. That's why you need God. God created and built in you a dependence upon him. The harder you try to do it yourself, the bigger the hole is that you dig. The harder it is that you try to do it yourself, the worse the mess is that you make. The harder it is that you try to take care of yourself, the more realize how weak you are. Can I get a witness in here that I know I got some folk in here that knows that I have made too many messes in my life trying to do it all by myself. So here you will never have enough within yourself, but then there's something else. Second thing is you got to recognize the potential in your possession. That's the listen that you're going to think, wait a minute, didn't he just say we don't have enough and all of that? Yeah, you don't have enough within yourself, but you still need to know that you got something in yourself. In the midst of the discussion, Philip is a, you know, Philip got his chest. That ain't no way in the world we're going to feed all these people. Jesus, I don't know how he sounded. I just think, you know, it might have sounded something like that. You know, Philip was just, he was ticked off, just upset. Now, you know, Jesus, it's going to take more than half a year's wages. Feed all these folk out here. The Bible says that it was 5,000 men, but just think if every man had a wife. That's 10,000 folk. And just think of every couple had at least two kids. That's another 10,000. That's 20,000 people. And Philip said, Jesus, what you talking about? How much money do you think it's going to cost to feed all these people? And here comes Andrew. Andrew coming from the back with a little boy with him. He said, Jesus, look, here's a little boy. He got two small fish and five barley loaves. Nobody even asked Andrew what he thought about the situation. Andrew wasn't even a part of the conversation, but Andrew came with what he thought could be a viable solution. Andrew came forward. In fact, we don't even know if it was Andrew's idea. Maybe it was a little boy who was getting ready to eat but looked around and saw all these people and said, Huh, I don't have much, but maybe, just maybe what I have can do something about this situation. He wasn't asked anything, but perhaps Andrew had some insight to think that maybe, just maybe, since we got the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, just, in, just because we have Jesus in our presence and we got two fish and five loaves, there is a possibility maybe that Jesus can make something happen in this situation. Perhaps a critical first step in experiencing God's provision is recognizing what we currently have. That's all that Andrew has done is that he's taken inventory. It has been brought to his attention. Look, we do have something. We got two fish and five loaves. Now, I just need you to understand what kind of meal we're talking about. We're not talking about two whale fish. We're not talking about two big fish like swordfish. We're not talking about two dolphins. We're not talking about two big fish that can feed several families. We're talking about two little bitty fish. Two little, little bitty fish like, you know, like sardine type fish. We're talking about two sardines and these five barley loaves. We're not talking about these big, long Miss Baird loaves of breads or these Aunt Millie loaves of breads, these Sara Lee loaves. We're not talking about five big loaves of bread cut up in slices, 30 slices a bag. We, we're not talking about Texas toast size loaves. We're talking about barley loaves, more like pancakes. We got two sardines and five pancakes and we got 10,000 plus people who need to eat. And so Andrew has brought it forward. What good is two sardines? Sardines and five pancakes going to do with 10,000 people. And we all about to celebrate because Andrew got the answer. We're going to give it to Jesus. But he opened his mouth a second time. Andrew said, here's a little boy. He got two fish and five barley loaves. But what is this among so many? Oh, man. Why did Andrew say that? Andrew just spoke where we speak. 
What is this among so Andrew had canceled out who he had in Jesus Christ? Because Andrew was looking again only at himself. Andrew had not now canceled out his potential and now realized that in fact I got this ain't enough to do anything with so we all not even bother with this. Have you been there before? That you realize that now you, 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 God has given you something, but in light of what your true need is, you feel like it's not even worth doing this little bit. You start feeling like, you know what, I'm better off keeping this in my pocket because after all, this is just much too expensive. I'm better off not even trying because it won't even matter. I ought not even go because nobody will notice me when I get there. We ought not even try to do that because there's just too many people who have needs. There are too many homeless people in Grand Rapids so why even go down to God bless Gio? What will $20 do in a sea of homelessness in the first place? Why should we even try? But here I need you to understand that everybody has something and so don't worry about what you don't have but pay attention to what you do have. It might only be two fish and five barley loaves but it is more than what somebody else may have and if you don't believe me you just read this Bible and know that God specializes in using small stuff people didn't have big stuff but God used small stuff and he blessed it you don't believe me you just keep on reading that and you will see that God uses small stuff all Moses had was a rod and God parted the Red Sea all Moses had was the same rod and a rock and when he struck the rock water came from it all Moses had was a tree in Mara and God told him to put the tree in the bitter waters of Mara and there the people had sugar water in the desert because they used a little that they had and God blessed that in fact Elijah was praying because there was a drought in the land and when he was praying the Bible says he saw a cloud the size of a man hand and the spirit said you need to get down to Jerusalem because there's a great rain coming listen you don't know what God can do but you got to take make sure that you use everything that you have you might not have as much as the next person but you use what you got you might not have much car but if it can get you from point A to point A and a half then you go to point A and a half as fast as you can you might not get to B but I promise you you got to start somewhere and so you got to do it and you got to do it even if it don't make any sense two fish and five loaves makes no sense but you got to recognize recognize what you have you need to take an inventory of your own life you need to pay attention to what you have right now in your own possession stop getting mad at the folk who got more than what you have and stop getting mad at God because you think you don't have enough if you got something I know you got more than enough if you got something you got everything that you need if you got something you have what you need why because it's right here in the last point and the last point is this you will have enough when you surrender see it, it was it was not don't don't get caught up on the the, the two fish and the five loaves because the two fish and five loaves was consequential what's more important is the hands that held the fish and the loaves see it's a matter of surrender what is the tension in this text throughout this whole narrative is the human perspective versus the godly perspective. The tension is in the fact that Philip and the disciples felt like they did not have enough. But what Jesus wanted them to understand was that because you have me, you always got enough. Because enough is not about what you have, but enough is about who you have. And enough is not about what's in your hands, but enough is about what you have, placing it in my hands. If you don't believe me, look here in the text. Jesus said, have the people to sit down. 
Now listen, Philip, I'm sure, is real upset now. He huffing and puffing now for real. I don't know why we out here doing this. Tell me. He probably going through the crowd to my sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. He probably talking to everybody mad. You know, he probably wanted to mean, you know, gee, right now the disciples have become ushers. All they got to do is just be ushers. They just tell, they directing traffic, telling people to sit down. Jesus said, tell the people to sit down. And now we got to deal with the two fish and the five loaves. As long as the disciples had the fish and the loaves, they never had enough to feed all of these people. But in an act of surrender, they had the people sit down and prepare them for supper. They were sitting down preparing to eat. The folk didn't know what was about to happen. The disciples didn't even know what was about to happen. But what happens magical is when there is a transfer of hands. The fish left the hands of the disciples and they were placed in the hands of Jesus. The fish, as long as they were in the disciples' hands, it was only two fish and five loaves. But some kind of way between the hands of the disciples and the hands of Jesus, two fish and five loaves became a meal for one person, two people, three people, four people, five people, six people. They just kept passing out food. They just kept passing out food. They just kept passing out food because it had left their hands and it had been placed in the hands of Jesus. That it was in the hands of Jesus and when it was in the hands of Jesus, their little had become sufficient. While it was in the hands of Jesus, two fish and five loaves was more than enough for their load of 10,000 people. I don't know who I'm preaching to right now, but but you got to be willing to relinquish what you are holding on to because as long as you hold on to it, it cannot be multiplied. You got to be willing to let go of your grip so that Jesus can take it from you and he can multiply it and meet that need. Again, you're not listening to me. You got to let go and surrender what you are holding on to so that Jesus might bless it. You're not listening to me. You got to let go of your career and let Jesus take control of it. You got to let go of your marriage and let Jesus bless it. You got to let go of your financial situation and let Jesus bless it. You got to let go of your physical health and let Jesus bless it. I know what it looks like but what it looks like ain't how it really is because you're looking at it from your own hands but you got to let go of it and put it in the hands of Jesus because in his hands my little bit becomes a lot I remember that song we used to sing in the gospel choir all in his hands I put it all in his hands all of my burdens all of my trials when I have a question all in his hands I put this and that, I put it all in his hands. This and that, I put it all in his hands. And you all know what happens when we put it in the hands of Jesus. I know it sounds cliche, but I'm a living witness. When you put it in the hands of Jesus, he knows how to multiply. He knows how to make it bigger. He knows how to make it better. He knows how to stretch it. He knows how to make it go long. He knows how to make it go deep. He knows how to make it go wide because he knows how to care for us. So now, you got to ask yourself, what area of my life have I not yet surrendered? In your place of lack, well, you feel you don't have enough. Have you put it in the hands of Jesus? Have you put it in the hands of Jesus where he can do what only he can do? Have you taken it out of your own possession and entrusted it to the care of God? And what God can do what only God can do. I said it before, God specializes in making a way out of no way.
God knows how to come through when you didn't think nothing else could be done. God knows how to show up in just the right nick of time. God knows how to bless you when it looked like you can't be blessed. Can I get a witness in here? God knows how to make things happen when stuff don't look like it's going to come together. In fact, there at the top of Mount Moriah, where Abraham was ready to kill Isaac, God had a ram in the bush. There at the Sea of Galilee, God stretched two fish and five loaves. But you don't have to have a Mount Moriah experience. God showed up at the gas pump. God showed up at the grocery line. God showed up at the dinner table. You still don't know how you fed for all your children, put them through school, put them through college. You still don't know how you made it through life, li living on a shoestring budget, but you never went without. God always made sure you had food on the table, gas in the tank, coal air in the AC, warm air in the winter time. You don't know how it happened, but when you surrendered unto God, God knows knows how to take care of you. God knows how to take care of you. God knows how to take care of us. It's a conversation about enough. And how does that conversation end? It ends this way. Jesus says, as long as you got me, you always have enough long as you got me you always have enough as long as you have me you always have enough if outside of me you'll never have enough you'll always be broke you'll always be lonely you'll always be frustrated you'll always be lacking but when you realize that you have me and you live the life of surrender you'll see that you'll always have enough. That's what he wanted the disciples to understand. That listen, I am the God of heaven. I am the God of creation. In fact, there were two fish and five loaves. But in the created order, God makes something out of nothing. They didn't go catch more fish and keep bringing it. Jesus made more fish out of nothing. That more fish kept showing up. Wasn't nobody going to fetch it. Jesus just let it come out. Jesus has let fish come from nowhere. The, the Bible doesn't tell us where it came from. We know that Jesus said he hungry. He needs something too. Jesus said she hungry. She needs something too. In fact, he gave so much that they had leftovers when it was all said and done. Isn't it funny how when you were growing up, you always had food in the house. And when you finished eating dinner, mama said, take this down the street to so and so because they hungry. Isn't it funny how you got more money than your parents ever had, but you ain't never got no food in your own house trying to figure out how you gonna eat but God knows how to take care of us amen let's thank God today for his word conversation about enough have you any rivers that seem uncrossable have you any mountains that you cannot tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. And he will do what no other but holy power can do. God specializes. God specializes. God specializes. He can do what no other power, no other holy power can do. Because God specializes. Can I get a witness? God specializes. God specializes. I need the folk who know that God specializes to talk back to me. Have you seen God make a way out of no way? Have you seen God show up when you didn't know it could be done? God!
specializes and he will do what no other holy power can do. God specializes. He specializes. He specializes. I don't know who needs to hear that, but I'm going to keep saying it. God specializes in the impossible. God specializes. Because Lord knows I need it. I need his specialization. I need his power in my own life. I need him to show up in room 534 in Medical City in Fort Worth, Texas. Right now in the name of Jesus, I need him to specialize. Anybody else need him? Will he do it? Can he do it? Won't he do it? Yes, he will. Yes, he will, God specializes God specializes church he does he does he shows up and when he shows up he shows up with resource everything that you need moving in a way that only he can move parting red seas opening blinded eyes making the lame to walk again raising up dead folk and restoring withered limbs that's the kind of god that we serve god specializes i need a saint with some season to come on and sing that song for us i don't care who it is but i'm gonna keep on talking to somebody get that microphone because god specializes Somebody got to know that song. Have you any river that seem that seem uncrossable? Uncrossable. Oh yeah. Have you? Have you any mountains? Any mountains that you cannot tunnel through? Tunnel through. Yes. God, God specializes. Can I get a witness? In things impossible that seem so impossible, he can do and he will do what no other, what no other power but Holy, Holy power. Ghost power. Can do. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Come on again, Gene. I tell you, God specializes. Specializes in things thought impossible. Have you? mountains that you cannot turn through God specializes specializes in things for them Possible. And he will do what 
no other. And he will do and he will do yes he will yes he will what no other power holy ghost power can do I Amen. tell you that God, God specializes, oh God, God specializes, God specializes, specializes. when your body is full of diseases, and your Don't give you no ease. I tell you that God, God specializes. I tell you God, God specializes, and He will do what no other power. Power can do. Amen, amen, amen. There may be somebody here right now, and you need the special power of God. We invite you now to respond to this appeal. That you may think that you you don't have enough, but friend, hear me when I tell you. You always have enough in Jesus.